Hello folks, it's Professor Fiore once again. We're back now with more on the if-else conditional clause in Python. Right where we left off, we saw the basic if structure here. Inside the parentheses we would have a test. So for example, maybe I have um, a variable, I'll just call it A. I'll initialize this to one. So if this is true, we might print something. All right, so I'll just say yeah, it's true. Else we'll say it's not true. All right, so this is where we left off. In this case, a is 1. We check it to see if it's 1. It should print out true. Let's run it. There we go. True. Let's change the value. It's a little quicker than using an input statement right now. Not true. Beautiful. Okay. Great. Now, let's change some things up here a little bit. I might need to check more than one thing. Let's say I have another variable. B. Let's set that to three. So what I want to do is a check. Maybe I want to make sure that uh, A is less than B, but I also want to make sure that at the same time, A is two. I don't really care in that case what B is, just has to be bigger than A, but A must be two. Now, if you think about it, there's lots of logical situations where this comes up. For example, if you come up to an intersection in your car, you know, when can you go through the intersection? Well, it's not just if the light is green. You know, the light is green and no one's in the crosswalk. Okay, so two things have to be true there. To do this, we have logical operators. We have two of them. There's the and and the or. So let's start with the and. Notice the color code on the word and. So I'm going to say if a is less than b and a is the same as 2, we'll print out true. Otherwise, we'll print out not. Okay, it is true. So if I said, you know, b was 5, these conditions are still true. On the other hand, if we said, leaving B at 5, if we said A is 3, no longer true. So this part is still true, but this part is not true. Okay, well, what if I need sort of the opposite situation? In other words, they don't both have to be true as long as one of them is true. Well, we have the or for that, right? As long as one of them is true, Boom, there you go. All right. Could be both of them. There you go. All right. As long as at least one of them is true. So I could say in this case, you know, I'll set B back to one. Again, one of them is true. That's this guy over here. Now, on the other hand, um, Let's say that uh, we do this, A is 0 and B is 1, what do you think is going to happen? True, because A is less than B, all right? What about now? Yeah, neither of these things is true. A is equal to B, it's not less than B, and A is not 2, okay? All right, now we can carry these on. We can have multiples, you know, I can check something else over here. This or this and this and blah, 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 and off we go, and we can actually set these up with uh, parentheses like so. Okay, and I can say, and I don't know, let's say and C is 1. I'll throw C in here. All right, what do you think is going to happen here? Think about it for a sec. 
That's not true, because this was an and. One of these two things has to be true, and this must be true. Don't care which one of these two. So how could we make this whole thing be true? Well, I could make this two. That would make this clause true. And there you go, there's your true. On the other hand, we could have left that at zero and then maybe taken B, right? Would that do it? I mean, A is no longer two, would that do it? Yeah, it would, because A is less than B, all right? All right, these things can get pretty complicated. Another way of attacking this is to put if statements inside other if statements. So we can do something along this line. I could say if A is the same as 1, so we could come in here and then say if A is, uh, you know, less than B, I'll go back and add a B. Then under that condition, kind of back where we were originally, under that condition, we will do the print, right? So I have an if inside of an if. And this could also have an else. Notice the indenting that's going on here. All right. So we'll say... Um, Not true here. And I just want to have something that's a little bit different than this wording. So this else will get printed if this is not true. This thing that says not true versus just not will only be printed if A is the same as 1, but A is not less than B. All right, see the logic on this? So let's run through this with some values. Let's see what we get. Okay, so I got true. Why? Is A the same as 1? Yes, it is. Is A less than B? Yes, it is. So we print true. Okay, now let's try setting B to 1. We get not true. In other words, we get this one. Because A is the same as 1, so it comes in and does this block. Then this block says, is A less than B? No, it's the same size, so it takes this else. Not true. Okay? Finally, we could do something like this, All right? Now, A is less than B, but A is not 1. So this whole thing should get skipped, and we should come down here and just print out not. All right? Okay. And if you're wondering, yes, you could down here have another if. I'm not going to chase that, but we could also do this. We could have an if inside here. Right? And so on and so on. We just keep indenting as we go. Right? You know, whatever's in here. And of course, there could be another else. It doesn't have to be another else. You know? But it will always wind up that, you know, this, this if and this else, they always have to match internally. So this is matches this one. This matches this one. If we had another else over here, now that guy's going to have to line up over like that. Um, if we have one associated with that inner, it's going to have to be like this, and so on and so forth. They have to match up. This is a requirement for Python. Things have to match up like this. It's the indenting that tells Python what matches with what. Otherwise, this can get pretty confusing. Okay. Now, if you didn't have that guy there, if it wasn't indented correctly, you had it like this, you know, would associate this if with no else, and you'd have this. But if it was indented, then that's that's as if there is no else clause for the whole thing. So they got a match. Remember that. They got a match. Um, this can get a little crazy after a while if you want to, say, check for a succession of values. For example, if we have a menu of something, um, A could take on, you know, values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. How do I do that? Well, you know, I can check to see if it's 1, do something. Else, if it's two, do something else, All right? So I'll just, you know, just put, I'll just put a blank print statement in here, just as a placeholder, just to show how this all works. 
else if a is the same as two, you know, we'll do something else if, I guess I'll just reuse this. A is the same as three and so forth. Okay, in which case we don't necessarily need this guy down here. Get rid of that. All right. Oops. And so on and so forth, right? So maybe from an input statement, we get a value for A, and then we come down and we check it. Is it one? Do this. Um, otherwise, is it two? Do this. Otherwise, is it three? Do this. Otherwise, and we just keep on going, right? The very last else would be sort of a catch-all for any other value. You can see how this is going to track diagonally across the page. Um, there is a more compact way of doing this. We can sort of combine the if-else into something called, called an elif. Okay. Um, and it's going to look something like this. I'm just going to push this down. We're not actually going to run this. But you can do something like this. Else if clause... You know, we do whatever it is. I'll just put a print here. Okay. And then else if something else else if so I'm really just doing what's going down here. So, you know, this would be like, uh, you know, is A the same as 2? Is uh, A the same as 3? Is A the same as 4? And so on and so on and so on. So kind of like this, it just sort of packs it up like an accordion, so to speak. Um, but it's a more compact way of expressing it. It's a little bit nicer. Okay, so let's take a look at an example of using that very thing. Bingo! All right, so I've popped in, just pasted in a little program that I've already written just to explain how this, how this all works. So this is a little program that will calculate current draw from a menu of battery choices. All right, so we have a startup print statement, just a title, so to speak, right? This program determines the current draw from a battery. And notice I've got a triple quoted string here. So this is going to be printed out literally like this. Here are your battery choices. So the small lantern battery, a large lantern battery, a transistor battery, AAA, AA, C, and D cells. Right? So that's our menu of battery choices. Um, usually small lantern batteries are 6 volts, large ones are 12. There are other sizes, but you know, I'm not trying to be exhaustive here. Just sort of want to show how this all works. 9 volt transistor batteries. These other four are all one and a half volt cells, right? Okay, so now we just ask the person to enter which one of these batteries they have. So I'm using an int here. We don't need a floating point value. So we have the input statement, turn it into an int. Remember the input statement returns a string. So I get a battery number, which should be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Anything else is, you know, bad. That's a non choice. Okay, now I have to ask the user the resistance value that um, the battery is across. All right, so we use an input statement, turn that into a float. So that's R. Now the calculation here is a fairly straightforward calculation, right? It's, it's just Ohm's law. I've got a voltage, I've got a resistance, I can divide the resistance and the voltage. Bingo, we have um, and the resulting current. First thing I have to do is turn this into a voltage. Right? The user of this may not know what the various voltages are. So this is a perfect example of using an else if, right? Bat num, battery number, can be a bunch of different values, just a listing of them. Okay, so if, if bat number is 1, in other words, small lantern battery, we'll set E, the voltage, to 6. If it's a large lantern battery, we'll set E to 12. If it's a transistor battery, we'll set it to 9 volts. And here's a good example of using the um, logical operator OR. If it's a 4, or it's a 5, or it's a 6, or it's a 7, any of these, it's 1.5 volts, right? They're all 1.5 volts of batteries. The only difference on these, other than the physical size, is the capacity. 
the amp hour rating of the cell, right? These get bigger and bigger ratings. They last longer and longer at the same current draw. Okay, they're all one and a half volts though. So this is a good example. Notice you can't say, you know, that number is same as four or five or six or seven, right? We have them individually tested like this. We set it to one and a half. Then we have a catch-all at the end, else. In other words, if it's not any of these things, if it's not one through seven, set it to zero. Why do I want to set it to zero? Well, because I want to indicate that that was an invalid battery choice, right? So here's another if. If E works out to be zero, and the only way it could be is if the user didn't choose one through seven, they chose something else. I want choice eight, right? I want choice zero. Um, then E gets set to zero and we print out that was not a valid battery choice. Get the heck out of there. Otherwise, do the calculation, right? And then print out the value. Now I've got two versions of the print statement here just to sort of illustrate what's going on. This is the basic way where we just sort of insert the value of the current. And then the second version of it uses um, a little format thing we talked about the other day. So we have a percent 0.5 G. Remember G is the smaller of E and F. So the 0.5 basically says it's going to take up five characters, right? Okay, so the syntax is a little bit different here. Let's run this. Oops. Okay, so here's our little, uh, our little battery menu. Again, the triple quoted print uh, string comes out exactly that. Okay, enter the battery number. So let's use just to start off. We really should be exhaustive and check them all, but I'll just grab a couple of them. Small lantern battery, that's a six volt battery. Okay, let's, let's just use one ohm. C calculate this in your head. Okay, so that's six volts over one ohm. That's six amps. Okay, all right, current draw six amps. Notice that's the top version, and then the nice clean version down here using the percent 0.5G. Let's run this again. Okay, let's use a large lantern battery this time. Um, maybe something that's got some fractions associated with it, like 3.3 ohms. Okay, so that's uh, 3.6 repeating decimal amps. Notice the nice compact version of this using the percent G. Right? That definitely looks a little bit nicer. And if you just used round over here, the round function, you could set it up to look nice for this value, but what if it's a really, really small current? You know, that might not come out the way you want. So, you know, let's try something different here. I'll go with a, a AAA cell, and maybe we have a, um, like a 4.7K ohm resistor, All right? Ooh, look at that. Right, lots of these digits. Um, this looks a little bit cleaner. Definitely looks a little bit cleaner. If we had a really big value, you know, we could have this, uh, it'll show up as like micro or something. Let's try another one. Uh, let's go with a transistor battery this time. And let's use, uh, how about a 56? Well, let's do, uh, what the heck, 560K ohms. All right. 560E3. Okay. So again, here's the G form. Definitely a little bit prettier. You know, there's our um, five total digits there that we're using. Now, I like to use the percent zero here. This is my little trick. Because that way there's, you know, if, it's a, if it just happens to come out to be a nice number like three, you don't have a lot of leading space. You know, everything fills in real nice. Okay. There's one more, actually, you know, the, the season that these should still work. I guess we could just do one of those just for complete completeness sake. Let's throw in 10 ohms. All right. Okay. So that, that was great. But there really is one more I want to check. Uh, I want choice 10. Because I've got a transistor battery and a D cell. Three and seven is 10. I'm smart. I are smart. Okay, that was not a valid battery choice, right? So that catches everything for us. Okay, so uh, this covers most of what you would probably do, you know, what you need to do with uh, 
with our little conditionals here. So now we've seen everything, right? If, if, else, um, if with an else if, and the logical operators, the or and the and. Okay, so we see how this all works together. From here, the next thing to look at is loops. How we can get code to iterate, to repeat itself with little modifications as it goes through. We'll look at that next time.